Well, I just want to welcome uh, some of you. I know that we've got a few extra people here today in light of all that's happening around the church and so for guests and first-timers as well as each and every week we discover that there are first-time in a whileers who haven't been here since COVID started and are just returning back to church. I want to let you know that we've been in the midst of a sermon series uh, since Easter looking at the acts of the Holy Spirit as God called and sent the church out into the world And that we're in the midst of that series now as we come to the scripture we heard this morning where the calling of God sending the word of the gospel out into the world creates controversy really for the very first time in the young church. Now, controversy and calling don't seem to have anything to do with music celebration or senior celebration, but they're certainly relevant in the world in which we live today because it is no secret that in the world we find ourselves, we are deeply divided on any number of things. Yes? Yes, and it may not be a secret that the church that we are part of, the United Methodist Church, is just as divided on a number of issues these days as well. And with everything going on in the service this morning, I would love to dig into and talk about any one of these issues, but there just isn't time to do that well, let alone to talk about all of them. And so instead, as we come to this passage from the lectionary, what I'd like to do in the time we have today is simply talk about how we might approach conflict, controversy, differing of opinion and belief from a Christian perspective. Because the reality is Christians have not had a good track record when it comes to being conflicted and of differing beliefs on things. In fact, whenever Christians throughout history have resorted to calling one another heretics, the church history is full of shameful behavior. But that's not what we find in our story today. When Peter's calling to include and welcome Gentiles into the Christian faith and church, he was immediately and heavily criticized. But unlike so much of Christian history, this particular moment of controversy ended quite well. It would flare up again in just a few chapters in the book of Acts. But in this particular story, the two opposing sides that were deeply divided, came to agreement and ended up praising God together. Why? How? And what might we learn from this to help us in the midst of the deep divisions, disagreement, and conflicts facing the church today? Before we dive into that, first I want to know something about you. When someone criticizes you, or when you find yourself in disagreement or conflict with another person, what is your go-to reaction? Everybody has a go-to reaction to conflict and criticism that we think, without thinking, just fall into. Do you know what yours is? Well, maybe yours is the most common default response to division, conflict, and criticism, and that's avoidance. How many of you in the midst of conflict try to avoid it? You willing to admit to that this morning? There's some of you, not as many as I'd expect. At the 8 o'clock service, it was almost everybody in the sanctuary. If you're one who likes to avoid disagreement and criticism, you tend to avoid it. You, You try to deny that it's even there. You might say, you know, everything will be just fine if we ignore this. If we don't talk about it, it'll resolve itself on its own. We'll just leave it alone and it'll go away. Or if the conflict and disagreement gets to be too great, those who tend to fall into avoidance will just leave and go somewhere else. That's the most common default, go-to response. The second most common is anger. How many of you hulk out in the midst of criticism or conflict? Got a few of those this morning. You are just ready to fight, whether verbally or physically. Those are the most common responses. Fight or flight, right? Anger or avoidance. Another pretty common response to conflict is wanting to talk it out, talk it through. Got any talk it outers out there this morning? That seems to be the most today. Those who like to talk it out like to discuss and think through things either calmly and logically or they like to argue. Either way, some people think that they can explain away a problem simply by educating those who lack the understanding that we have. 
those are some of the most common go-to reactions to conflict, criticism, and disagreement. There's positive and negatives to each. There's even appropriate times when each of those is the right response. But having now thought about ourselves, let's look at the story and see how Peter responded to the criticism from those who disagreed with him. What did he do? And why did what he did result in unity rather than division? In the story today, we heard about Peter's disagreement and division with the other leaders in the young Christian movement over his inclusion of Gentiles in the church. What Peter did was he went to the home of a commander in the Italian regiment of the Roman army named Cornelius. And while he was there, he began to talk to Cornelius and his family about Jesus and the gospel. And as he did, the Holy Spirit fell upon them. And so Peter baptized that family and then stayed there with them for several days eating together with them and lodging in their home. Sounds pretty controversial, yes? No, not really, not at all, in fact. In fact, rather than controversy, you'd be forgiven for thinking that instead of fighting and arguing about this, there should have been celebration. I mean, that's the normal response to people coming to faith in Christ and being baptized. The normal response is joy. But there was no joy to be found here. The other Christian leaders back home were shocked and appalled. They couldn't believe that Peter didn't know any better because in those days, good Jewish people just didn't associate with any non-Jewish people known as Gentiles. And so Peter inviting Gentiles into the faith and then eating and staying with them in their homes broke every social and religious taboo that existed for centuries. So when Peter came back to Jerusalem, we read in the passage that the circumcised criticized Peter. Now we really should put quotation marks around circumcised because that was the name of a group, a party within the young Christian movement who believed that in order to be truly Christian, one must convert to Judaism and live according to all of the customs and ways of life therein. Because at this point in the story, up to this point, Christianity was seen more or less as a new sect within Judaism as the gospel had remained in and around Jerusalem. So this party, I'll call them the Sea Party, we had heard what Peter had done, how he had in their minds broke the very law of God that was laid out in Scripture as clear as day. They were ready to read Peter the riot act. And while we certainly can see living 2,000 years later with the benefit of perspective that the Sea Party was ultimately incorrect in their assessment of the situation, given the fact that all of us sitting here this morning are Gentiles, and yet we're welcomed into the church, we really can't blame them for their reaction. If you think about it, the Sea Party really had every right and responsibility to challenge Peter. Because what was happening was new. God was literally doing a new thing. And so the sea party had no way of knowing that what Peter had done, he didn't just decide to do on a whim or hadn't just decided to do on his own, nor did they have any way of knowing that Peter was initially just as conflicted as they were And that it was only after God made it abundantly clear through visions, signs, and multiple confirmations that Peter went the course and took the action that he took. The Sea Party couldn't have known that. From their perspective, Peter was recklessly abandoning the faith. And so while they were ultimately proved wrong, In a way, they really weren't wrong for wanting an explanation because this was new. And so Peter, when he got back to town, before he could even unpack, the sea party was waiting for him at the door, criticizing him. And when they did, how did he respond? Well, he didn't respond the way that you might expect. If you know anything about Peter from the way that the Gospels portray him, you know that Peter is a bit impulsive and he tends to act without thinking, usually very aggressively. The old Peter would have put on quite a show for being criticized. Here, though, it said, Peter began to explain everything to them step by 
step. How boring, right? Where did the real Peter go? The fun Peter. The Peter who would have grabbed a sword and cut off one of the ears of one of his accusers just like he had done in the Garden of Gethsemane. Where is the Peter that used to hulk out in the midst of conflict? Or what happened to the Peter that liked to brag about how great he was? Why didn't Peter respond like he did at other times saying, really? Really? You think I'm wrong? Do you know who I am? I am Peter, and Jesus himself put me in charge. He said, upon me, he would build his church. I'm kind of a big deal. But Peter didn't do that. Why not? Because God had changed him. God had filled Peter with the Holy Spirit. And so Peter didn't have to argue, attack, get angry, or avoid the conflict. Instead, he said, let me tell you, step by step, everything that happened. And what's amazing that as he tells what happened is how little Peter speaks of himself. His accusers wanted to make the problem about Peter and what Peter had done. They wanted to make it personal. But Peter refused to make it personal. He refused to make it about himself. He refused to make it about them. And instead, he kept the focus squarely upon God. Peter said, here's what God did. Here's what God's doing. Who am I to get in God's way? Peter didn't play the game that we get so caught up in playing these days. We make everything about us. Here's what I think. Here's what I feel. Here's what I want to see happen. Especially in the midst of conflict and controversy, we tend to put ourselves at the center of the event, the center of the story, and everything becomes about us. It becomes about what we think, what we want, what we feel. Peter did the opposite, which was a huge change for him. Gone is the Peter who told Jesus when Jesus said he was going to Jerusalem to die. Gone is the Peter who said, I don't want you to die, and so I refuse to let you. Gone is the Peter who said, you know, Jesus, it doesn't feel right that you should wash my feet, and so I refuse. Gone is the Peter who said, Jesus, seeing you transfigured up here on the mountain, I think that the best thing we could do is to build some structures and keep you up here so we can just bring everybody up to the mountain so that they can see you in all your glory. That's the best thing we could do. Peter's story was always about what he thought, what he felt, what he wanted, and every time he operated according to that, he screwed it up and made things worse. But not here. Here, Peter put aside his own beliefs and bias. Peter put aside what he initially wanted to do. He put aside everything he had thought since he was a child about the unclean, evil Gentiles that had been taught to him and reinforced by his parents, his friends, and his culture. And instead, Peter put God at the center. What does God want? What does God think? What do I feel God is asking me to do? What God wanted to happen was to reveal to Peter that God's love knows no boundaries. God's love shows no partiality. God's love in Christ through the Holy Spirit is meant for all and is given to all and can be received by all. To say or think otherwise would be to get in the way of what God was doing. Peter refused to make the conflict and controversy personal. And instead, he simply looked for where God was moving in the Spirit and then testified to it. 
And so his testimony was essentially, you know what, guys? I get that you're upset about me, but God gave a vision. And I know, I thought it was crazy too, but the vision came three times. And I might still have ignored it or wrestled with it if he hadn't given the same vision to Cornelius, who came and confirmed exactly what I had heard and seen, which is just way too much of a coincidence. It's impossible unless it was of the Holy Spirit. And so I went with six other believers. I didn't just go myself. I took other people with me so that all of us together could see if this was really happening or not. And so as we told the Gentiles about Jesus, we all agreed that the Holy Spirit fell on them just as it had fallen on us. And it wasn't just me seeing this. All of us together in community agreed. And as it was happening, I still didn't know what to make of it. But then I remembered that Jesus told us this was going to happen. It was Jesus who told us that he would baptize with the Holy Spirit. And since they were baptized with the Holy Spirit, how could I, who am I, that despite everything I've always thought, everything I've always known, and no matter how awkward this whole thing made me feel, how could I get in God's way? Peter's experience of what the Holy Spirit was doing allowed him to reevaluate his long-held traditions and beliefs, to see the truth of what Jesus had said he wanted, what Jesus desired, and what was now indeed actually happening. And as Peter explained his reasoning, hearing what God did and how God confirmed repeatedly that it was God acting and not Peter, the other leaders of the sea party finally, finally got to a place they could praise God for being more gracious, more loving, more accepting of people than they ever thought possible. So that through this controversial calling of Peter, they could be led to a celebration of the goodness of God in community together. And so we might need to ask ourselves, in the midst of whatever divisions and conflict confront the church at any given time, and there is always going to be division, there's always going to be conflict, this was the beginning of the church and it was there and it will continue until Christ comes again. In the midst of whatever is confronting the church at any given time, what and who will we focus on? Are we going to focus on searching where God is moving in the Holy Spirit? Or are we going to focus only on ourselves and our own personal, long-held beliefs, opinions, traditions, feelings, and wants? Will we feel that we have to justify ourselves to prove why we're right and why others are wrong? Or we, will we allow God and the Holy Spirit to prove what is already true? Let's learn from this controversial calling of Peter to not make division and conflict personal about us and what we think, feel, or want. Not that what we think, feel, or want is bad. It's not. It's just that what we think, feel, and want is often deceptive. And when we keep our focus there, it's easy for us to fall into the problem and the trap of the sea party. When we do that, we do what a friend of mine likes to say. We make the minor things the major ones. When we make the minor things the major things, it causes us to miss the main thing, which makes a mess out of everything. So we've got to keep the main thing the main thing. And what's the main thing? The work, grace, and love of God in Christ Jesus experienced through the Holy Spirit. If we could just keep our focus there, perhaps we'd be slower to criticize those who disagree with us. And in the midst of the controversies and conflicts, perhaps they might not always end in arguments, fights, division, and needing to avoid one another. But instead, by focusing on God, we might join together in praise of the God whose love is always greater than we know, whose grace in Jesus Christ is deeper than we can imagine,
and whose Holy Spirit will only and always lead us to the truth. It's in the name of this Father, Son, and Holy Spirit we pray and hope. Amen.